Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Oop, one second. No, I'm not. Now I am. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chris Knudsen. Uh, you've joined us for EMS Medicine Live. Uh, it's now January 2016. Uh, we've gone through one year of lectures. Um, you've survived the snowpocalypse. The X-Files are back on TV, and it must be time for our January session. Uh, just a little bit of news uh, before we continue. Uh, 2016's annual conference with NASP was fantastic. Uh, we got to meet with uh, the Education Committee and the Communication Committee and talked about collaborations in the future, so more to come about that. Uh, Brian uh, Clemency in Buffalo raised the possibility of perhaps making CME available for these lectures in the future. Uh, so we'll be working on that. Maybe in July we'll have some CME available both for future sessions and retroactive for past sessions as well. But stay tuned, we'll work on that. This is us, uh, medical directors for this course. There's myself, there's uh, Derek Cooney out of Sing Upstate with me, and the uh, good Brian Clemency out of uh, Buffalo. Of course, as always, uh, this is meant to be a uh, a forum for education for both community and academic uh, programs. Um, we'd like to make it live so folks can interact with each other and share information. Uh, we do do some board preparation and uh, we do like to hear from you. So uh, at the end or in, in the middle of questions or uh, comments speak up. Uh, everyone is muted right now uh, just to keep the background noise down. If you have questions you can text it to either myself Usually it's the EMS Medicine Live, which is my laptop next to me, but since I'm looking at my own screens, you can text me directly uh, or raise your hand in the uh, virtual chat window. I am recording this. Uh, all past sessions are available online. Uh, you can Google us with the first two hits. Uh, you can also look on YouTube. Uh, we have a channel there as well, which I'll add next time uh, to find all of our lectures. Any questions at the end, just unmute yourself. Uh, at the very end, I'll unmute everyone for questions. Uh, or message us for questions we can bring up to the very end. So today's speaker is me. Um, if you don't know me, I did my residency at, uh, at uh, University of Pittsburgh, did my fellowship there as well, uh, moved to the, the uh, wintry lands of SUNY Upstate about six years ago, and uh, work in all things EMS with uh, Derek and our uh, pre-hospital team. I am coming to you from my basement, uh, not from my office. Uh, I don't trust Upstate's uh, internet or my work computer, so we're going to try it on my home computer, and hopefully the videos and uh, mixed media will work better here. So um, at NESP, uh, was it last week um, or two weeks ago, uh, David Tan did a great talk uh, about the Ferguson response he did uh, with his uh, SWAT team uh, and the prolonged experience they had. Uh, sitting through it, uh, recognized a lot of the less lethal weapons they were using or had as part of their team, I thought we should do that again, or I should have done this talk before, but we're gonna do it for uh, EMS Medicine Live today. So why are we discussing this? Uh, we're gonna talk about the different types of less lethal weapons. So why are we doing this? There is a large use of less lethal weapons uh, by law enforcement, probably, in probably increasing. Enjoy, guys. Right. Um, and increasing uh, over the past uh, decade, uh, going back to 2001 uh, in uh, Quebec, uh, there's a large use of uh, plastic bullets and tear gas uh, between riot police, um, military forces, and uh, protesters. Uh, so over 300 plastic bullets, almost over uh, almost 2,000 canisters of tear gas, uh, and it was a large event. Uh, going to Duke, uh, when Duke beat Arizona is just as one example of what college kids can do after they uh, win 
a, a national championship. They went out and burned couches and flipped cars and did all the typical things that college kids do. Uh, 2,000 students were out and the police had to use uh, rubber bullets and less lethal weapons to uh, help disperse the crowd. And if you go through your own uh, colleges or uh, college experience, you can think back to when students did silly things and police had to come break them up. Uh, Toronto in 2010, uh, 10,000 protesters, uh, 20,000 uh, security forces, tear gas, riot police, and over uh, 750,000 Canadian dollars in damage. I don't know the, the, uh, uh, the change into American dollars, uh, but still a lot of money. And of course, Ferguson 2014 um, had a very prolonged police response, as David Tan des described in ASP. Um, tear gas, uh, LRADs were used and millions and millions of dollars of property lost and uh, tax dollars spent on the, on the response, um, but uh, less lethal weapons were, were used in force. And locally, um, on a more one-to-one -one scale, uh, back in 2013, we had a case here in Syracuse of a gentleman who tried to commit suicide by, by police, um, was brandishing a weapon, uh, threatening police. Uh, we, looking back on it after we learned later, uh, he was trying to end his life that way. The police were smart enough uh, to not use their, uh, their uh, lethal weapons. Instead, they shot him with multiple bean bags, which I'm sure did not tickle, uh, but did disarm him. Uh, he got into custody and, and uh, was put in jail and later got the help he, he needed, uh, where if the police only had lethal force, uh, may not have happened. So what are the, what's the goal of less lethal weapons? Obviously, the goal is to gain compliance and cooperation, either through pain or incapacitation, and to let hopefully not kill you in the process. Uh, the term less lethal is obviously compared to uh, bullets or, or uh, guns, which are much more likely to kill you than what else uh, police are using now. So breaking up into what types of less lethal weapons are out there, uh, obviously things that make your eyes water are chemical irritants, long history of use. Uh, the Chinese used lime dust in the, seven, in the uh, sorry, 17, 178, get my numbers right, uh, to, uh, as a form of tear gas uh, in the Caribbean islands. They uh, burned peppers uh, to uh, push the colonists back. Uh, moving up to World War I, obviously the Germans used chlorine gas um, to uh, fight the uh, Allies and used mustard gas as well, and tons and tons of chemical weapons were used with a great loss of life uh, and uh, injuries. Uh, more modern, Sorry, I'm going to mute whoever just came on. There we go. Um, more modern, obviously, we have the modern chemical agents, uh, mace, tear gas, and uh, capsaicin sprays. Uh, pepper spray used to be the oil of hot peppers, but they've improved upon it, made it synthetic to, uh, to use. How hot are they? Um, so habaneros, uh, I'm using Schofield units. Um, so Tabasco sauce, like 7,000. Uh, cayenne peppers, 30,000. Scotch bonnets, which I've used once in my cooking and never again, between 100,000 and 300,000. I think the Naga uh, Cholokia is the um, ghost peppers, if I'm not mistaken. Someone can correct me later, but one of those is the ghost peppers. If you watch Man vs. Food at all, you'll see him eating ghost peppers on a regular basis, and it is quite painful. Um, and then pepper spray, it's about a 2 million uh, Schofield rating. Uh, how do you deliver it? Usually it's handheld. Um, and that's, uh, usually it's uh, handheld sprays. Um, call from one, sorry. Three, one, five, five, six. Derek's trying to call me. Um, handheld sprays, uh, rifle launchers, um, and also lead to the chemical symptoms, you know, eye irritation, um, watery eyes, problems breathing, shortness of breath, uh, and nausea and vomiting in severe, severe cases. Let's see if this works. So common use, spray of the eyes. You see the color is orange um, um, to mark where the police are applying it. Hurts quite a bit. And it's difficult to shake off, obviously. I believe this is a, either a police or some sort of uniform officer who's been exposed to it. On the flip side, you have the opposite of police. 
So the gentleman on top was able to kind of resist a little bit. Uh, with well, the gentleman below, perhaps less motivated than uh, police officers, um, are incapacitated and can't, can't resist or can't fight through it at all. Uh, there is a risk of corneal abrasions uh, with chemical irritants, obviously, uh, probably with rubbing of the eyes. Um, there have been a couple of papers on this where a large use of pepper sprays did not cause corneal abrasions or folks uh, with their handcuffed um, didn't get corneal abrasions. So probably this pepper spray by itself doesn't cause eye injuries. It's the rubbing and the irritation that happens afterwards uh, that causes the problem. Usually brief symptoms, only uh, hopefully 15 to 30 minutes, fully resolved within one hour. Um, treatment in the ER is uh, irrigation of the eyes, take off the contaminated clothing, uh, as is typical decon, and uh, get the skin to the air. If you need to, do a slip, slip up exam to look for eye, eye injuries. Uh, we had an incident in Syracuse a, a year or two ago uh, where we actually had a barricaded patient or a gunman uh, that the SWAT team was responding to. It was a prolonged standoff. They were using tear gas on the patient. Um, and at some point, he shot himself in the head and survived the gunshot. Uh, police were able to figure out that uh, he was down by using a handheld camera that was thrown inside. SWAT went in, took him outside, and they kind of handed him off to uh, EMS at that point in time. And EMS picked up the patient and took him uh, right to the trauma bay, which was kind of unfortunate. Uh, was uh, unfortunate. Uh, for the paramedics and for the, uh, the trauma staff and the ER staff who received them, there was no decon done after the patient was taken out of the house. So basically he was gassed, he had all of his clothes on, and he went from the front of the house uh, into the ambulance with a grave injury, uh, point that out. Um, but the paramedics almost suffered uh, a car accident from having trouble driving from the tear gas they were being exposed to. Uh, and in the trauma bay that brought him in didn't decon him before bringing him to the ER. And the same tear gas effect affected the trauma surgeons, the ER staff, and all the nurses. And eventually they went to rotating back and forth from the trauma bay out into the hallway um, trying to get over the uh, tear gas effect. So it probably should have happened, looking back in our um, after action report, a simple taking the clothes off and uh, some irrigation in the field before getting him in the ambulance could have, you know, saved the paramedics, uh, paramedics and uh, uh, decreased the risk of a car accident and could have greatly helped the trauma staff when they received him. Uh, granted, he had a, a bad brain injury, uh, but you want to avoid getting yourself hurt uh, from responding to these cases. Uh, not always effective. Well, it hurts quite a bit. There is cases where you can fight through um, the uh, pepper spray. So people who have uh, problems with uh, overexcitation, intoxication, they're combative or just motivated, uh, they can fight through somewhere between 10 and 15%. Uh, and this is a, a good case of use before for my excited delirium talks. Gentlemen, uh, we think he is on PCP or some other uh, stimulant. Starting to approach population center and the police appropriately try to stop him. So she's preparing her pepper spray in her hands, wearing gloves, obviously, which is a good idea. Gentleman assaults a fence, pulls things out, shows how intoxicated he is. Right about here, they start using pepper spray, and they can see, has no effect, he fights through it, and a chase ensues. So while pepper spray is an important tool, uh, you have to be ready for folks who can fight through it, especially uh, like we have here in Syracuse with uh, synthetic uh, spike being a big issue. Uh, moving on, things that cause pain, uh, kinetic impact munitions. Um, obviously the police can have uh, ballistics that are designed to hurt you or to push you back, but uh, not kill you, or at least they're trying not to. Uh, different devices they have, rubber bullets, uh, devices that fit in cartridges uh, to use in their handguns, um, uh, bean bags for shotguns, rubber box sh buckshot also for uh, shotguns, uh, solid foam batons, which I actually have not seen personally, I've heard about, 
uh, and tail stabilized projectiles. All different devices used in different types of platforms uh, to deliver uh, munitions designed to hurt and incapacitate but not, not kill you. Obviously when the police are using these, they're trying to aim for uh, proximal arms or legs or the torso, um, which can hurt quite a bit. But they're try they should try to avoid obviously the head, the neck, uh, the chest, you can see in this gentleman here, he took a round right in the middle of his chest. He's doing okay, but dangerous place to hit. Or of course, the groin as well. Um, I don't have any pictures of uh, real injuries, but this looked like it hurt. Um, but so places to aim for, places to avoid. So how much does it really hurt? Uh, I always show this. Uh, to go back to uh, Jackass from many, many years ago, uh, demonstrate how painful this is. And I'll just let this run for about two minutes. And we're going to shoot you with one of our projectiles. It's called the Pemphen. It's a 40 gram tail stabilized bag. We'll be traveling up to 250 feet per second. Is that lethal? It, it's considered less lethal. So this morning, I thought I was taking it in the chest with the beanbag projectile, but George and his company said no way it was in me in the heart. I'm pretty much done with. So uh, if we want to take every single precaution right. necessary to help protect your vital organs. Where are my intestines? Are they in that area? Thanks, sir. Awesome. Uh, so you go take some practice shots? One thing that surprises me about this is how accurate they can aim uh, with these bean bags the distance they are. This is nothing for anybody to just throw a 12-gauge shotgun and take a take. That's one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I can do this in a controlled state. So obviously hurts. Bad bruise. You see the way I see that bean bag with my stomach? That's instinct. All right. So obviously there's plenty of injuries you can get from these. You saw a blunt injury and contusion, uh, abrasions, uh, hematomas, uh, whether it be the belly wall and the muscle or uh, an extremity. Uh, you can get pulmonary contusions. Fractures, obviously this is a skull CT with a fractured skull, uh, should not shoot people in the head. And uh, intra-abdominal injuries, uh, I believe this is a liver hematoma. Uh, and of course, while these should be blunt uh, injuries and not cause penetrations, penetrations have been known to occur, uh, whether they penetrate the abdomen, uh, the chest, uh, the eyes or the face, uh, this is a CT of the head, I assume, uh, from a description with a, uh, either a foam baton or a bean bag uh, in the uh, face and the nose. Uh, these things aren't the easiest to aim. Uh, they're designed, um, aim at folks not as accurate as uh, shooting a rifle or a handgun, uh, so some uh, degree of error can occur. And of course, there's episodes of hitting bystanders, which is not what you want to do. Uh, Joe Suyama uh, from Pittsburgh published a paper uh, in 2003. I guess there was an incident in, in Cincinnati where he did his residency uh, and I believe fellowship. Um, and they used less lethal weapons, including kinetic impact munitions at that time. And they found most of them are extremity injuries, uh, but a lot of uh, head, back, and chest injuries uh, and uh, abdominal hits as well. There are several case fatalities in the literature. A uh, 14 year old boy hit in the chest. Um, obviously had a cardiac standstill. He had no broken ribs, uh, no other signs of trauma and the autopsy. 
a uh, woman hit in the chest, bone fragments caused uh, heart and lung injuries. Someone else hit in the chest as well, rib fractures, uh, penetrated solid organs and caused uh, death that way. So uh, some things to keep in mind, uh, depending where you hit, depends on how well you can resist uh, the, uh, the impact. Uh, these are not act totally accurate. Uh, if the officers don't aim for the right place or use them at the wrong distance and cause problems, uh, or if they mistake a le less lethal for lethal and they use the wrong device. Um, I didn't pull up all the, the recent uh, news cases, but there are plenty of examples of uh, police reaching for what they think is less lethal, grabbing lethal and uh, harming people by accident. Treatment, obviously, trauma evaluations and uh, trauma workup. A um, couple other different types of uh, kinetic impact munitions. Um, there is a compressed air weapon, uh, which is kind of like a paintball with a uh, tear gas in it, uh, which they can shoot at people, and not only do they hurt, um, but uh, they also cause uh, a tear gas effect. And this is new uh, for me when I was doing some, up, some research about uh, new less lethal weapons for this talk, um, something called the alternative, uh, which I hadn't heard of before. Uh, which is a plastic metal, I guess not plastic, it's a metal ball which is fit over the tip of a handgun um, and it kind of softens the blow of a bullet. I'm going to play this from CNN because actually it seems to be a fairly good summary. This is the alternative. Less lethal, less lethal. It's like an airbag for a bullet. It looks like a toy that attaches to a real gun, but it is nothing to play with. The new device is intended to give a suspect one last chance to live. Put the knife down, sir. The police decide the situation is dangerous enough to use lethal force. Let's lethal, let's lethal. Bang. It's actually created by a retired sheriff officer, and he did not like the fact that people were being shot when the officers do have time, but they had no other option in lethal force. The makers say it's not to be used in split-second decisions, but only when an officer has three seconds or more to react. What does this do to the body? Well, it's going to feel like getting hit in the chest by a Major League Baseball player with a hammer. The bullet merges with the metal bowl, which travels about one-fifth the speed of a regular bullet. It could definitely breaks. I mean, could it kill you? There, it, it absolutely could, and, but we know a bullet kills you. There is a possibility that this could kill you, but it is very slight when you compare that to a bullet. CEO Christian Ellis says after nine years in development, it's ready. Police. It comes as police across the country face intense scrutiny and protest over the killings of unarmed suspects. So far, there is only one police department in America that has decided to test the device. Ferguson, Missouri. Yes, that Ferguson. The department. So I'm going to stop it there. It was uh, the Ferguson Police Department apparently had it. I don't think they deployed it or used it all from what I can read. Um, there may be more information out there. The rest of the story talks more about the unrest. Um, the, there's some other videos about this as well, um, where one difference versus this versus other less lethal, you get one shot uh, and then it transitions immediately to lethal force after that. Uh, which makes sense. You only get one shot and then you use this this ball at the tip. Um, I don't know. We'll wait and see if we see more about this in the future. I have to ask my my uh, police guys about this, if they've heard of it or have any plans to use it. Uh, I have not seen it locally as far as I know of. Of course, uh, same problem as uh, uh, chemical irritants. There's tolerance possible if you're intoxicated, high in PCP, synthetic marijuana, agitated, combative or motivated, you can work through the pain of these, these weapons. Uh, moving on, uh, things that make you go deaf or hurt, uh, talking about explosive distraction devices, uh, more commonly known as, known as stun grenades or flashbangs. Um, these are made to um, be used by police when entering a uh, building uh, or uh, somewhere else to help confuse and disorient uh, uh, patients and divert their attention from where the police are coming through or, or uh, coming towards them. Um, they're either explosives or flash. Uh, they have either flash powder in them, get very hot, create a pressure wave, a loud, uh, uh, loud bang, um, and disorient the patient. Uh, it can also have a flash component too, where it has a bright light um, to, uh, to blind the patient as well. Um, I've seen this used a couple times now with the Syracuse uh, SWAT guys. 
Uh, I've been very impressed in how loud and how effective these things are. Uh, in our last call out, I believe they used it and uh, the patient um, may have had a handgun close by, uh, but chose instead to hide in the closet. And uh, as police entered, he got so confused and so distracted by the, uh, the flashbang um, that he just, just ran and hid and fortunately didn't fight. Uh, we had another case though, uh, about a year ago, where we used it um, against a, a house we're going into with multiple people inside. One patient was so intoxicated, he slept through the whole thing, which is the uh, first time I've heard of that as well, but he was not a threat, obviously. Uh, there's bursting and non-bursting. Uh, bursting where the canister explodes, uh, and non-bursting, I guess, where the ends open up and uh, lets the uh, light and gas out, and that's focused hot air. Uh, obviously causes ringing in the ears and tinnitus, a disorientation and problem seen for at least several seconds. So here's a demonstration of how um, it should be used. You can see the you can see the pressure wave. You can see the effect it had on the building around it. Uh, loud, I think there's a loud flash as well, and it kind of goes through multiple uses. So please throw in, step back, let it work, and then go in. This is not how it's supposed to work as a other example. Doors open, they don't throw it out. Fortunately, no one got hurt. So they thought it was more funny than anything else, but um, you know, obviously when you throw it, throw it through the door. Um, these things are not without risk. Um, there have been multiple cases of uh, problems. Uh, if the pin falls out where you're carrying it in your BDU pants, uh, it's gone off before causing burns and uh, thigh injuries. Uh, if you take out the pin and don't throw it, um, it goes off in your hand. Uh, there's been cases of amputations of fingers as well. Um, if you have it too close to you, the operator or the patient themselves can cause more than expected injuries. Um, and I forget if this last case was in Syracuse, I read this about somewhere else. Um, where they threw a flashbang in, the patient got startled before it went off, rolled onto the flashbang, exploded right underneath her, and of course, uh, it killed her. That's pretty extreme and unusual, uh, but obviously points out it's not a, a totally safe device. And if you are working with your SWAT teams, um, you know, be prepared to, to handle the trauma for either the patient uh, or for your team members if they're gonna use these. So obviously, you have to worry about blast injuries, uh, TM ruptures, uh, abdominal injuries, burns if you get too close to the skin, fractures, soft tissue injuries, major bleeding, or uh, falls if you get startled and, and fall off a staircase or fall out a window, um, all are possible. Um, you, in theory, you, have, you can fight your way through this uh, if you're combative or motivated. Um, in my limited experience watching uh, our SWAT team work, this seems pretty hard to fight through. Uh, the explosion, the light, and the noise are all so significant. Uh, even if you want to fight through it, it's going to incapacitate you for some period of time, which is probably more than enough police need to get into where they're trying to get to. Um, but it's, I would say this is pretty hard to fight through. Uh, things that make you say arg and swear uh, would be uh, conducted electric energy weapons. A brief example of how you can have, friend, have uh, fun with your friends using CEWs. I don't recommend you do this to your guys. I never tried this on my friends, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, you can try it and let me know. So, so all conducted energy weapons, uh, really taser is the only type. Uh, I kind of think of as a Band-Aid as a Band-Aid, but it's really a plastic bandage, um, but there's only one Band-Aid you know of. Uh, taser is kind of the only conducted energy weapon uh, that's being made as far as I'm aware of. Um, taser initially was an acronym for a Thomas A. Swift electric rifle. Uh, was made by a NASA scientist uh, back in the 60s. Why he was making this, I don't know. 
Uh, if you don't know who Thomas A. Swift was, uh, he was a hero in kind of pulp fiction type science adventure stories back in the 20s and 30s, I think. Um, he was the original MacGyver, um, and uh, he made things to, to help save the day, same as MacGyver. So there have been multiple versions uh, going back through the decades, Tasertron, Taser 3400, the M26. Apparently the M26 is the, was the version used on Rodney King that did not work so well. Um, but since then, they've moved on to the uh, Taser X26, uh, which came out about 15 years ago. And it's kind of the, the type of Taser, at least I've been familiar with, uh, through my residency and since then. Um, and these are all two darts attached to electric wires, uh, come back to a battery pack. Um, and they fire uh, compressed gas to, uh, to eject these. Uh, civilian models are only 15 feet. The military and police carry models that go up to 35 feet. But the problem is the spread of the darts is such where over 15 feet they become much less accurate. So even though the police and military can reach further, they're still only really effective about 15 feet. And I'll have a small uh, hook at the end to either get into your skin or your clothing, uh, whatever is being shot at. Uh, about the size of a uh, number eight or ten fish hook, I forget which, but kind of small. Uh, 50,000 volts, uh, 1.7 joules, multiple shocks per second. It's considered a nerve stimulator. And you can see the examples of officers who are um, uh, being exposed to the taser, trying to get towards the person using it. And it causes muscle constrictions and, and inca incapacitates you so you go to the ground and uh, you can't get at the officers the idea at the very least. And this goes on. But um, so you get the idea where it's different than the other less lethal weapons you've seen so far, which cause inflict pain or irritation. The taser is going for pain, but also trying to stop you as well. Uh, there was a new version called the C2, which came out about six, seven years ago. I haven't heard too much about it um, in the past couple of years. Uh, initially, uh, it was initially marketed um, as a uh, more, what was the word I'm looking for? It was a more, um, uh, less dangerous looking type of device and it was definitely marketed towards uh, women as a uh, uh, personal protection device, came in different colors. Uh, fit into your purse or uh, your pocket a little more easily versus the uh, X26. This has a 30 second stimulation time where if you hit someone, it's made where you hit them, you drop the device and you're supposed to turn and run. Um, 30 seconds is a long time to be uh, shocked with a taser. Um, the company that makes the taser says they've done studies enough to say where it's not dangerous. I haven't seen anything to the contrary. Uh, I have not seen these in anyone myself, so I'm curious if actually making sales or if they're still around or not. I did want to include one video um, just because it's, it's pretty cheesy, I'll be honest. But uh, it gets the point across well. So they get Hans, who's a uh, a hand-to-hand uh, -hand instructor, and they're going to try to show you how indestructible he is. So you can't beat them, you can't choke them. This is probably my favorite. We're trying to be choked and it's just not working. So Hans versus the taser, he can't beat him to death, but man, the taser can stop him. Ah, ah, all right, all right. 
So poor Hans can't take the taser. I'm not sure how much of this is staged, but uh, it's good publicity for them. I don't know how long I stayed up here, but I thought that did at the moment. If I started going down, I started cracking my muscles. I could get some confidence on it. My muscles on the right side stopped cracking even further and further and further. That's when I was, I was saying, all right, all right, all right. So listen what Hans has been through. I got hit with a grenade. It knocked the wind out of me. But it, uh, I continue on. No big deal. Right here. Knocked the wind out of me. Knocked the wind out of me. But I was continuing. I was still continuing my mission. I've uh, endured a lot of pain. Just looked at my knees. I was able to focus. Pop it in place. Fuck me. Continue to fight. But I've never... They hit with something like that that actually knocked me on my ass and I can't continue to run it, but just lay there like a little baby. So you can be hit by a grenade, you can dislocate your knee and duct tape it back in place, but the taser hurts worse than that. Um, I don't know, it's just a fun video to watch. I don't know if any of that's true or not, but it's uh, you can share that with your agencies later as a uh, humorous example of how effective the taser is. Uh, now without risks obviously causes punctures puncture wounds is made to do that um, Lacerations abrasions are possible There have been lots of cases of uh, muscle strains. You can strict so hard you can hit hurt There are cases of vertebral fractures when it's used on little old ladies I don't know how many cases there have been used, but it's been shown to happen before uh, Keep in mind uh, pepper sprays uh, do have an accelerant in them uh, so if you are pepper sprayed and then they're tasered, there's a chance that the uh, energy can arc across the, uh, the pepper spray and uh, cause a flash burn. Um, so watch out for those. And of course, injuries from falling and head injuries from falling as well. Uh, another example out of the, I think this is Marines, I'm not positive. Uh, but you can see when they deploy the taser, these people get hit, they can't stop themselves. And these people are trying to be held up, not doing a great job, but all going to the ground. So you can see why secondary uh, muscle skeletal injuries and uh, head injuries can happen. Kudos to the guy on the right for braving through it. He's the only guy who stayed on his feet. Uh, there are some serious injuries. Uh, if it goes into the eye, that's not good. There have been cases of a pneumothorax when it hits the chest and more thin people. Rare, but does happen. Of course, you get in the neck, the breast, or the groin, very sensitive areas. You have to be uh, careful in taking these things out. Um, Boozman did a uh, idea of how often injuries occur uh, using the taser, uh, using looking at uh, people put in jail after being tasered. Uh, most have no injuries. 23% uh, have puncture wounds, contusions, last small lacerations, uh, but mild injuries. Less than 1% do have either intracranial injuries from the fall. So keep that in mind. If you do fall and take a significant head injury, you got to keep that in mind. It was one case of rhabdo. They don't know if it's from the taser or from the um, something the patient, the, uh, patient was on, which got him arrested. They weren't clear about that. Um, but so for the most part, very safe, but you have to keep a high level of suspicion for more serious injuries. Uh, one of the biggest concerns are dysrhythmias. Can it put someone into VTAC or VFib? The answer from Taser is consistently no. Um, they say they'll, they'll present evidence of doing um, EKG monitoring and echoes and people are tasered and see no change in troponin. Um, They'll, they'll quote the hundreds of thousands of people who've been tased as part of their police training who do just fine. Um, in dog models, they'll tase the heart directly, and the number of joules are not enough to induce uh, cardiac dysrhythmias. But still, there have been other cases. General with pacemaker, uh, his divorce device recorded VTAC during the taser bursts, and there was a, a teenager who had a VFib arrest. After being tasered, was it excited delirium? Was it the taser? Not sure he survived. Um, I think the the cases of uh, cardiac arrest after taser are pretty small from what I can read and understand, um, but uh, still a concern. Uh, obviously, you want to take out these darts. Who can take them out depends on your, your specific location. Uh, where I trained in Pittsburgh, the police were allowed to, but EMS was not, which was odd at the time. Um, so you have to check with your own region and own uh, area to see who could take them out. Uh, taser encourages uh, police officers to do it. Tase them, take them out. You can put them in jail afterwards. Taking them out is not tough. Uh, they recommend stabilizing the site. 
and just pulling it right out, either with your hand or with uh, forceps, as long as it's not in a very sensitive spot, which may take a surgeon to, to get involved. Uh, here's a here's a case of a, a, a taser right, bar so being removed at the University of Georgia. So taser marks, this is being very easy to pull out and it should have much resistance, but watch this. This is interesting. Some pain, okay. So watch his hands. So he tries to keep his fingers away from the barb to start with and pull straight out. Puts his hand closer to it to get better grip. Stuck, moves his hands right next to it. And he yanks it out. So here. This video will end up on YouTube, but you don't have any problem with that. Okay, thank you. I don't know if that's all the consent they got. Sterilized area. But going back and you see them pulling it, it, it's not a small amount of force, at least in this case. I don't have a large number to compare to. Um, but if you're having your providers pull them out or your police, um, make sure they know they may have to put a little force behind it. And my only uh, take on point is watch your fingers. You're pulling out a barb out of somebody's skin. If you put your fingers right next to it, I could easily see someone dragging that barb right across their fingertips and cutting themselves. And obviously, if someone's being tasered, maybe at a higher risk for uh, other infectious diseases if they're on drugs um, and don't want to have, have that happen. Um, so if you have your providers taking, out, taking these out, uh, talk to them about taking them out, how to do it safely, and, and watch, watch their own safety, of course. Do you need much of an assessment afterwards? Um, pretty much I don't do much besides a quick trauma assessment. If they got tasered, uh, take out the dart, make sure they didn't get hurt anywhere else, uh, do a, a decent exam, and then, then go off with police. Do I, I don't do an EKG usually myself. Um, I think it's a pretty low yield test um, for someone who's been tasered. If there's a concern though, you can always do it as a screening test. Kind of other less lethal weapons, um, aerosolized uh, calmatives. Um, so things are out there um, as uh, chemical agents to help incapacitate folks. Uh, aerosolized fentanyl or carfentanyl, which is actually a uh, veterinary uh, type medicine, which we don't use for large animals, uh, but they can be uh, aerosolized to um, basically put folks to sleep. Uh, BZ gas is anticholinergic. You can use this on people. Probably not great for a civilian population. Uh, it causes two to three days of anticholinergic delirium, um, which is probably not what the police want to cause. I'm sure hospitals would not appreciate that. My guess this is more military application if it was used at all, or Valium as well, which I never heard of being used. Uh, aerosolized, uh, of course, going back to uh, Moscow in 2002 when the Chechen rebels took over a uh, theater, took 800 hostages with uh, 50 rebels uh, holding them, had a three-day standoff. Um, and there's a rescue attempt where, I think it was police or military went in, and they used a gas on the theater. What that gas was, we don't know. Uh, we suspect it was fentanyl from the description of how people went to sleep afterwards, and there's a lot of cases of respiratory arrest. Um, there were about 127 fatalities, that's what, about 15%. Uh, and it was a mass, from what I, the little I've read, uh, obviously a mass casualty situation, lots of airway compromise. And here's one example of a patient transport to the hospital from the scene. And this gentleman, of course, is uh, not in a great airway position uh, for transportation. These folks look like they're doing fine. Uh, I have no idea if he was a, a death or just happened to be found, but it obviously shows whatever they used uh, really knocked some people out and they had uh, problems getting folks to the hospital uh, uh, properly. And the doctors never knew uh, what the agent was. Um, I don't know if they tried Narcan or not. Uh, one of the more the newer things, um, long-range acoustic uh, devices or LRADs. Um, these are high-frequency uh, sonic waves. 
uh, to cause pain, disorientation, nausea, and discomfort. Uh, first used in Pittsburgh uh, back in 2009 for the G20 summit there. Give a, a brief uh, example. So police with an LRAD approaching a group of people. So a very typical LRAD device mounted on a vehicle. Uh, it can be focused in a certain area. Uh, and obviously you saw how the people responded. They kind of scattered, they kind of covered their ears and scattered, which is I assume what the response they want. They want to push people back or move them off the street um, to, uh, to clear an area. So obviously the further away you are, the less effective it is. These folks can hear it, but not being, not scattering, obviously. Uh, moving on to CNN or Fox coverage of uh, Ferguson. You don't see quite the same response. So, Here's the police, I believe. So that's interesting. So as I'm watching that, I don't see people scattering, but the person on the ground says people are leaving. Again, what, what they want to have happen is disperse crowds. Um, so uh, Dr. Tan talked about this at uh, NESP, uh, where the LRAD, along with tear gas and smoke, were kind of the main deterrents to, to move people along. Uh, there's also a factory deterrence or skunk gas, uh, which they can uh, spray folks, uh, smells like sewer or like a skunk. Uh, using by Israel uh, defense forces on uh, to disperse crowds. I haven't heard about it being used in the U.S. Uh, maybe someone can correct me on that. And one thing I've heard about for a very long time, directed microwave energy weapons. Uh, these are meant to uh, uh, to aim energy at either enemy combatants or with the military or at civilians, uh, causing pain and folks to turn and kind of leave the area. Sort of a more Ideas being a more effective LRAD type device. Uh, from what I've read, it's not actually been rolled out or used, um, as far as I can tell. Uh, I keep I keep this in the back of your mind, and maybe it'll come out in the uh, in the future. And lastly, just talk talk about excited delirium. Just a reminder, um, excited delirium, uh, description of uh, uh, syndrome, uh, some combination of psychiatric illness, intoxication. PCP, synthetic marijuana, cocaine, uh, and some sort of uh, uh, compromised folks with diabetes, heart problems, uh, where they get restrained, they fight, they get restrained, either, either physical, uh, chemical spray, taser, or something else, and then they die, going into sudden cardiac arrest. Um, just keep in mind, if there are any of these devices are being used, uh, watch out for this syndrome, early intervention, cooling, uh, benzos to help calm the patient and avoid that that uh, the sudden quietness they can get right before they arrest uh, is always a goal. So if they can quiet, be very worried. So summarize, we talked about chemical, kinetic, explosive, uh, taser, and some other newer types of less lethal weapons. Uh, keep in mind sudden and cardiac uh, in custody death. And I'll leave so you with this if, thought. If all goes correctly, for me anyways, this is how it's supposed to look. Right here. This is what it's supposed to look like. Paul G. Ready, set, go. Okay, ready, set, go. <laughs> Raises lots of questions like, what are a bunch of people drinking beer doing with a taser device in the first place? I don't know. Uh, but if you want to take it to your next uh, beer outing with your friends, go ahead. I did not promote this. I'm just telling you. Uh, but it is uh, an idea. So I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions. 
Uh, that's my talk. I'm going to unmute everyone. Watch out. All right, so that's my talk. Any questions from the peanut gallery? Well, I got to tell you, um, Chris, I just wanted to mention, so I've actually did a medical assessment on a suspect in custody after they stepped on or stepped very near a flashbang. And I got to be honest, he had a hole in his sock. There were burns. There was no injury. Uh, and the, the uh, carbonaceous marks on the floor were literally two inches from a full tank of gasoline or a full can of gasoline. Jeez. So they say it's, they say it's not a good permit to some degree. And uh, obviously, they're probably multiple different products, but at least this one seemed to cause you no know, heat or uh, disru disruption. Nice. Uh, he did. Uh, he was in a full run and apparently slammed right into the wall because he was disoriented. <laughs> but, but he actually came away with that with no injury either. But it was just very interesting. I'd never seen or heard of that before. But a nice big hole where his sock disintegrated and just a little bit of that sort of carbonaceous um, powder yeah. just kind of popped into the calluses of his feet. And that was about it. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, I have no idea if there's better devices these days than um, – before, but that's that's good to know. All right, so I'm gonna wrap this up. So this is our schedule for 2016. Uh, obviously, it did Leslie Opens today. Uh, we have uh, some Pittsburgh, uh, Indiana, New Mexico, uh, UCSF, San Antonio, and some Penn State folks talking uh, over the next year. If you're watching this and want to get involved, uh, we need someone for February, July, and December still. Uh, we asking folks to pitch in. Um, but otherwise, we wanted to thank you for taking part in EMS Medicine Live, and we'll see you back next month.